Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, coming to our Yom HaShoah program. And before we uh, start the introductions, I'd like to ask Rabbi Fogel to come up and light the memorial candle. We're going to light the candle and then say the Yisko prayer in memory of the six million who were murdered and in the Holocaust. So I light this candle in memory of the six million uh, Kedoshim martyrs who were murdered of Kiddush Hashem to sanctify God's name. Yiskor Elohim Nishmos HaKadoshim V'atahorim Shehum Tzu V'shu Nehergu V'shu Nishchatu V'shu Nisrafu V'shu Nitfu V'shu Nechadu K'al Kiddush Hashem V'avur Shul Lineder Atein Tzedakah V'ad Haskoros Nishmoseyim B'zchar Zetian Afshoseyim Tzuros B'tzor Achayim Im Nishmos Avram Yitzchak Yaakov Sar Rivka Rocho V'leya V'im Shor Tzadikim V'tzad Konios Shebegan Eden May God remember the souls of the holy and pure ones who were killed, murdered, slaughtered, burned, drowned, and strangled for the sanctification of your holy name. In their honor, I will, do, I will give charity or do a proper deed. As a reward for this, may their souls be bound in the bound of life, together with the souls of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, and together with other righteous men and women of the Garden of Eden. Now let us respond. Amen. So as the, the years pass, the number of Holocaust survivors dwindle, and the most horrific event in human history recedes into memory. The obligation then becomes more urgent to remind ourselves of what can happen to civilized people when bigotry, hatred, and indifference reign. No single observance, no one day could ever equal the task. The Holocaust spanned years of suffering, death, and terror. But the obligation to remember will always be with us. So on April 12th, 1951, the Knesset, Israel's parliament, proclaimed Holocaust and Ghetto Revolt Remembrance Day to be the 27th of the Jewish month of Nisan. The name later was simplified to Yom HaShoah. Since all things considered, Yom HaShoah is a relatively new observance, at least in terms of Jewish history, there are no set of rules or rituals. So what kind of observance could capture and explain the unexplainable? but the obligation to remember must always be with us. And as Jews, as lawyers and educators, we have a special burden to teach others about the Holocaust. What happened, how did it happen, and how could the rule of law fail so completely? Could it happen again? And so each year at Toro Law, we do our best to fulfill that obligation. This year, with a wonderful exhibit so graciously on loan from the Jewish Refugee Museum in Shanghai, it recognizes not only the suffering, but celebrates the heroism of those who helped Jews escape and the miracle that allowed lives to continue in Jewish culture to survive. Many of us at Toro have indeed visited the museum in what was originally a synagogue where the Jewish refugees gathered and which has been faithfully restored to its original 1930s state. After this, the talk here today, please stay and visit the exhibit on the second floor atrium. There are a number of famous Shanghai Jews that uh, might be familiar to you, including former US Treasury Secretary Michael Blumenthal, Harvard Law Professor Lawrence Tribe, and artist Peter Max, who many of you know, uh, his son is a Torah Law graduate. I have to admit that until my first trip to China in 2008, I really had no idea about the importance of Shanghai being an open port during World War II. As a result of the ability of Jews to enter Shanghai, then under Japanese occupation, to escape the reign of Hitler, a significant Jewish community developed. As you will hear today, life in Jewish Shanghai was not always easy. But the city was a refuge where about 18,000 Jews found not only survival, but a place where they could worship freely and live without constant fear of 
imminent death, but there were significant challenges. After the war, uh, many of the uh, Jews in Shanghai left Shanghai. In fact, almost all of them did. But the Chinese government remarkably created this museum to commemorate the unique role that Shanghai played in the history of human freedom. A number of Shanghai Jews have written books describing their personal journey through the city. As with all Holocaust survivors, this population is aging, and there are fewer and fewer who are able to tell their eyewitness stories. This is why Torah Law is actively seeking funding to work with the Shanghai University of International Business and Economics, the Shanghai Municipal Government, the U.S. Embassy, the Israeli Consulate, and others to hold the June 2015 conference in Shanghai to further the study and research on this remarkable chapter in history. We have a significant application now before the claims conference as well as uh, with some other potential funders. Leading the planning for this conference has been Professor Roger Citron, who is going to introduce our speaker today. Roger. Um, thank you, Dean Salkin. Uh, our speaker today is Evelyn Pike Rubin. Um, she is an activist, an author, and a lecturer. And she was born in Breslau, Germany, um, where her ancestors had lived for many generations. And in fact, her parents were raised as strict, strict Orthodox Jews, a tradition that they passed on to Evelyn at a young age. Now, as Evelyn is going to tell us, she was born just before Hitler came into power. And so her only memories of Germany were those of Nazi Germany. Uh, the only other thing I'm going to say in this introduction about Evelyn is that in 1939, at the age of eight, her family fled Germany for Shanghai. And I'm not going to say any more because it's really Evelyn's story to tell. And it's such an interesting story. Two other things. One is that Evelyn's book, Ghetto Shanghai, uh, is available for sale on the table uh, near the front here. Secondly, I want to thank Beth Mobley and the library for putting together, uh, and you can take a copy of this, uh, it's a one-page document, both sides, Sanctuary in Shanghai, which is a select bibliography um, of books in the Toro Library about Jews and the Jewish experience in Shanghai. And I should add that the collection about Jews in China is much larger than that. And so this page is just a, a subset of what we have in the library on this very interesting topic. Um, thank you for coming. And please welcome Evelyn Pike Rubin. First thing I'm going to say, uh, can everyone hear me? If you can't, just raise your hand, because sometimes I might turn away a little bit. Well, as you heard in the introduction, I was born in Breslau, Germany, which is now Wroclaw, Poland. But at the time I was born, it was Breslau, Germany. And uh, the story of the survival of approximately 18,000 Jews in Shanghai has not been well publicized. And I appreciate that the Chinese, uh, the present Chinese government, particularly the Shanghai Municipal Council, has taken it upon themselves to publicize our story. I mean, it's been publicized in books and people like me who've been giving talks, but it really has not been that much open to the general public. Um, to, uh, I'm always asked, how come you went to Shanghai? Well, to tell you about that, I have to give you my own background. My mother was the youngest of seven children. Uh, her father was a Talmudic scholar who died in 1910. And uh, I guess a modern thinker for those times because my he had his daughters as well as his sons study the Talmud and Gomorrah with him. So my mother was very well versed in the Talmud, and she went, of course, to a Hebrew day school. Uh, my father was born in the town of Yarochin, Germany. Yarochin, Germany, at that time, had a nice Jewish population. 
his uh, parents, grandparents had been there for generations too. He did, he did not have a rabbinic background. Uh, came the First World War, and my uh, father, like all good Germans, including Jews, enlisted in the army. He was um, captured by the French at a big battle of Verdun, ended up in a French prison hospital. And after the war, when he got uh, his various medals from Kaiser Wilhelm before his abdication, went back home to Yarochin and found out that he had a home no longer. Under the Versailles Treaty, Yarochin became a part of Poland. So my uh, grandparents had the option of remaining there and changing their nationality to Polish or of leaving uh, to retain their German nationality. Obviously, my father, having just come home as a German soldier, they opted to leave, and that's how my uh, mother and my father met. My, as you can well imagine, a Talmudic scholar did, had a fairly comfortable living, but there wasn't that much to go around. And when he died, and my uncle, two uncles went into business, and two uncles became rabbis, and his sisters got married, my mother was the only one around with my grandmother, and really her sole support. And she did something which for today is not unusual, but in 1916, the middle of the First World War, female Orthodox, Jewish Orthodox female, she started her own business. She started a paper and twine business, and by the time she met and married my father in 1929, she had a flourishing business with salesmen, dozens of salesmen going throughout Germany. And therefore, when I was born, I had what today you'd call a nanny, what's called a kindermädchen, because my, both my parents went to business. Of course, the business closed at one o'clock on Friday, and, and we went to shul, we had a strict kosher home. Uh, we had, uh, the way I was raised was also a little bit unusual. My parents were Orthodox, Zionist, and patriotic Germans all in one package, which was a little bit unusual, but that's how I was raised. However, that changed, of course, after Hitler came to power. Uh, my, one, uh, my one memory as a tiny child, I was close to three when Hitler came to power, was um, that my father decided to hang the flag of the German Republic out the window. And when the landlord of the apartment house we were living in came running in and told them and said, uh, Herr Popilatz, you gotta take that flag down. You're not allowed to hang that flag. There's only one flag you're allowed to display. And the one thought that's been in my head all that time was, at the time I was thinking, what's the big deal about a stupid flag? But of course, I did not know it was more than just a stupid flag. I was gonna find that out soon. Uh, my parents sent me to a Jewish nursery school, and every winter, uh, my parents went skiing to the German Sudetenland of Czechoslovakia, where there was the one kosher hotel where the German Jews from that part of Germany went for the winter vacation. 1934 was the last time we ever went there. In 1935, I was told I was going to next year when we go, you're going to take your first uh, skiing lessons. Well, that was not to be. Uh, under the Nuremberg Laws, German Jews were not allowed to leave Germany except to emigrate. And I want to make it clear, till approximately 1940, there was no problem leaving Germany providing provided you could show the Germans that you had a place to emigrate to. In other words, exile, leave and not come back. And obviously, going on vacation, you left and came back. So you were not allowed to go on vacation. Uh, from what I understand, when Hitler came to power, my uh, mother said, I think it's time we left Germany. And my mother was, her whole life, she was a realist. My father was an optimist. And my father said, oh, happened before, pogroms, massacres, we're still around, Hitler's not gonna last, let us wait and see. 
By 1935, the signs went up in the parks, the Juden ohne Wunsch, no Juden, at, uh, no Jews allowed. I had taken ice skating lessons, I wasn't allowed to do that anymore. I had taken swimming lessons, I wasn't allowed to do that anymore. I was lucky, I as a person, was lucky in one respect. Uh, my nanny, who was an Aryan, um, when she used to walk with me, I never had a problem. Uh, I still have my blue eyes, but I don't have the blonde hair. I had the blonde hair and I was never accosted. I never personally had a problem in the streets. As the Jewish child of a veteran, I was permitted to attend the public schools. However, my parents opted to send me to a private Jewish school. But now my parents wanted, saw that they had to try and leave Germany indeed. And I would come home from school and I'd see various books there of try, trying to learn different languages, Portuguese hoping to go to Brazil, Spanish hoping to go to, to Argentina. Uh, one of my cousins, they had made their way illegally into Palestine. We knew that they were in Palestine, trying to go th through there through the British mandate. And um, no, nothing to any avail. One of my mother's brothers, who was unmarried, he was not a rabbi, he was in business also. The day Hitler came into power, he rang our bell and he said, it's the end for the Jews in Germany. I think you should leave right now. I'm having my chauffeur drive me through Switzerland into France. And well, we did not go with him. And he ended up in Paris. Uh, he had a very good business in Paris. So uh, my father, who spoke French fluently, had picked that up when he was a prisoner of war, asked the um, French government for a visa to visit him in Paris, hoping to get papers for us to emigrate to France. He was denied uh, because he was just a brother-in-law. So my mother tried, and they gave her a visa because she was the sister. So she went to Paris to visit her brother, and she tried to get the necessary papers to emigrate to France. She was refused. In ret retrospect, of course, we did not know it then. We were lucky. My uncle Leo ended up in Auschwitz under the Valdiv Roundup in 1942. So now we still had no place to go. My one remaining grandmother was my father's mother. She had a sister living in the United States. My great-grandfather had been a trader, and on one of his stops took my grandmother's sister with him, and she ended up in New York, and she got married, so she was living in Brooklyn Heights at the time. My grandmother was corresponding with her. So she asked her to send us an affidavit. An affidavit, I think most of you in the room may know what that is. You had a sign you will take care of a family that you're sponsoring. If you had enough money, you could sponsor your own affidavit. We had the money, but it was in the wrong funds. It was in German marks. The funds had to be either in pounds sterling or uh, US dollars. So we could not sponsor our own affidavit. And unfortunately, she wrote back and said, I cannot sponsor you, don't you know America's in a depression? So there went another hope. Then came, of course, the uh, Anschluss, the annexation of Austria in the spring of 1938. And we had to turn in all valuables to the Germans, anything sterling silver and uh, jewelry and um, uh, precious stones and anything like that. Of course, having a kosher home, we had a, a lot of uh, flatware to turn in every day, uh, dairy and meat, uh, for the holidays, for company, for Passover. So they got a lot of stuff from us. And of course, the meticulous Germans gave receipts for everything. Married couples were allowed to keep their gold wedding band, and everybody was allowed to keep one gold watch. I still have the gold watch that my father gave, uh, that my mother gave my father on the engagement and the two wedding bands, my parents' wedding bands, my mother made into one ring, which is this, so I still have that uh, left, left over. But Austrian Jews at the time saw that they had to leave in a big hurry indeed. Somehow somebody found that they can get to Shanghai, and I'll talk about the political uh, part of Shanghai in a moment, that they could get to Shanghai, you did not need a visa, you just could just go get on a ship and go. And of course, word trickled down to Germany 
there is a place that you can go, and that's Shanghai. You can get there without a problem. And people were starting to consider it, people who were waiting for visas to go to different countries, hoping to emigrate, United States, England, et cetera, et cetera. I remember walking in the street with my mother, and people wouldn't stop to just say hello. It would be, hello, when are you going and where are you leaving to? And they'd say, well, I'm going to the United States. You lucky person, I got a visa for here. Oh, that's terrific. Well, I'm going to Shanghai. Shanghai? You gotta be crazy. Nobody goes to Shanghai. You can might as well take your coffin with you. Now, today, we know what Shanghai's like. I've been there twice. Every, many people here may have traveled there. You see everything on television. You know books. You know what's going on. You know the life there. But it's hard to put yourself in the place of a, and I'm trying to do it because I was a kid, so as an adult, I have to put myself in my parents' place and try and do that. In 1938, for a Western German Jew or Austrian Jew to just pick him or herself up with their family and go to a place so far away and so unknown, Shanghai, was a very, very big move, and people weren't just about to do that. Even though there were anti-Semitic uh, laws in place, and uh, the stores wouldn't sell to Jews, and there were, and I'm sure you know all that, I don't have to go into details about that, we all knew, um, we weren't in such a hurry to go. Uh, also around that time, my uh, great aunt, my grandmother's uh, sister, sent an affidavit to us. That came about because of an organization still in existence today called the HIAS, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, which told people in the United States who had peer relatives in Europe that if they just signed the papers, they would be the guarantors. So if those relatives come there, they wouldn't have to take care of them. HIAS would take care of them. They would not be on welfare, and there would be no problem. And under those conditions, we received uh, those uh, Precious papers, the affidavit. However, unfortunately, there's a fly in the ointment, a rather big fly called the American Quota System. The American Quota System was established approximately 1921, 1922, and it says you belong to that quota where the city of your birth was located in 1922. Now, in 1922, the city of my father's birth was Poland. We had never been Polish. We never lived in Poland. We never had a Polish passport. My father had been a German soldier. My mother had always lived in Germany, and we were on Polish quota. And when we asked the American consulate, uh, said, we're German. We have a German passport. Uh, you're on Polish quota. German passport, uh, German quota, they said, there was room, you could, you could leave right away. Polish court is filled, and they gave us a number. Hoping that that number would come up, um, in the middle of 1938, my parents sold the big apartment we had. We had a very nice, luxurious five-room apartment. Uh, my mother had bought uh, beautiful objets d'art and different things during the years, because she had a very good business going. That went for a pittance at Nazi-mandated prices. We had had to leave our, um, our Aryan nanny go because there was another law that a, um, an Aryan female was not allowed to work in a Jewish household where there was a male present uh, as a sleep-in. So um, it was called Rassenschande, pollution of the race, so we had to let her go. And I had a young Jewish girl who now walked me to school every morning. And we moved into a three a uh, bedroom apartment together with my one remaining grandmother, my father's mother, who had come to live with us after Hitler came to power. We had our bags packed, hoping that something would come up so that we could leave immediately. Beginning of November 1938, my mother uh, went to Berlin, where the American consulate was located, to see what the status of our visa was. Around that time, there was a young Polish man by the name of Herschel Grinspan. He lived in, uh, he went to the Sorbonne in Paris. His parents uh, were stateless. They had been exiled from Poland and were living in Hanover, Germany. And Germany said, you're stateless, you have to go back to Poland. Poland says, we can't take you because you're stateless. So they were in limbo. 
and he got very despondent. He purchased, he purchased a pistol, went up to the um, German consulate in Paris, and decided he was going to shoot the first German whom he saw. And he did just that. He shot the foreign minister by the name of Ernst vom Rath. And the Germans let it be known, should Ernst vom Rath die, there would be severe reprisals against the Jews of Germany. Ernst vom Rath died November 8th, 1938, and November 9th was the infamous Kristallnacht. Of course, this was just a pretext. They would have done what they did anyway. But anyway, that was the pretext. So November 9th, my mother was in Berlin at the American consulate, who closed their doors the moment that the first synagogue was put to the torch and no visas were ever given out again. Um, my, uh, the young girl who was going to walk me to school came running in, said, I don't think there'll be school today. There's something going on. I don't know what, but uh, I can see fires and I hear uh, glass being smashed. I don't know what's going on. My father put on the radio. All he heard was martial music. He decided to leave the girl with my grandmother. He took me over to a friend's house and he went to his place of business where the Christian landlord put him up, hid him in his attic. November 11th, Goebbels made an announcement that this action, as they call it, this raid, was over. My father came out of hiding and against the advice of the Christian landlord left to find what's happening with me because nobody didn't really know what was going on. My mother was in Berlin, my grandmother was with this young girl and he went into the apartment house where I was staying with a friend. The Gestapo happened to be in the same building. He was arrested and sent to the Buchenwald concentration camp. In the, in the meantime, my mother did come back from her fruitless mess, uh, mission to Berlin and now she decided to take matters into her own hands. My father always wanted to wait for the uh, visa for the United States. He wasn't gonna go to Shanghai and my mother decided she was gonna buy tickets for Shanghai. At that time, my grandmother refused to go. Absolutely not, she wasn't gonna go. So my mother bought three tickets on a Japanese ship, the Hakushaki Maru, to leave the following February from Naples for Shanghai. Among the first to be released was my father because the Germans always being impressed uh, with military heroism and medals and stuff like that. So uh, my father and others were released after three weeks. Almost everybody who was arrested during the Kristallnacht program ended up being released, some sooner and some later. And uh, my mother t told me in later years, it was with much trepidation that she said to my father, you know, I bought tickets for Shanghai thinking he was gonna make a big fuss. And his answer was, if, using today's vernacular, of course, if we left yesterday, it wouldn't be soon enough. And mind you, Buchenwald and Dachau and Sachsenhausen, that were the three concentration camps used to incarcerate Jews above, uh, male Jews above the age of 18 during the Kristallnacht program, were not where they got what they were gonna become in later years. They had been established by Hitler in 1933 to incarcerate uh, dissidents nuns, priests, homos homosexuals, communists, anybody who didn't agree with Hitler would be uh, placed in there, not pa just particularly Jews. For Kristallnacht, it was all for, for Jews. So on uh, February 8th, 1939, uh, uh, February 8th, 1939, we got on a uh, train uh, to uh, Italy, to Naples, and boarded the Hakusaki Maru, to Shanghai. We left on February 13th, 1939, to arrive in Shanghai on March 14th. It was a wonderful voyage. It was a luxury ship because all the ships that took refugees from Europe at that time were all cruise ships. So we had a very, very nice ship, very nice trip. We stopped in Port Said. We stopped in uh, Colombo, uh, now in uh, Ceylon, now Sri Lanka. We stopped in Bombay, which is now Mumbai. We stopped in Singapore and Hong Kong to arrive in Shanghai to uh, the biggest culture shock that you can well imagine. Shanghai at that time was occupied by the Japanese, the victors of the Sino-Japanese War of 1937. But at that time, it was loosely occupied. When I say loosely occupied, 
because even though they were in charge of everything, they did not bother the British who were running the French concession, uh, the, um, the British uh, settlement where they had all the office buildings, or the French, they were running the Concession Francaise, the French concession, where I like to describe it as the Long Island of Shanghai. It has nice apartment houses, nice private homes, parks, and tree-lined streets. They did not bother them. They fully occupied a section on the other side of what was then called the Garden Bridge, on the other side of the Huangpu River, over the Suchow Creek, called Hongqiu. Hongqiu had gotten the brunt of that 37 war. It was mostly in ruins, poor Japanese, Poor Russians and poor Chinese lived there. And, um, but there was housing to be had, dormitory style housing. The American Joint Distribution Committee had sent over staff members, including a woman by the name of Laura Margulies. She died about oh, 10 or 15 years ago. She was put in charge of helping the refugees settle. Well, we thought, of course, we'd be there a few months. If anybody had known that we were going to be there between eight and 10 years, we were there eight years. Even at that point in time, I don't think they would have gone. Everybody thought, you know, a few weeks, a few months, we get visas to go here, we go there, no problem. Well, the joint didn't know how long we'd stay either, but however, they had to house people. So they uh, created dormitories for the refugees to get settled and uh, soup kitchens and so forth. And uh, my mother, who was a very resourceful lady, my mother decided that even though we, we couldn't take our monies out of Germany, just we were allowed to draw from our household, our monies had been frozen, we were allowed to draw from our household monies in Germany, just enough for living expenses. But uh, there was really no money money. So, but she decided she was going to take stuff with her. We were allowed to take out all personal possessions. The Germans didn't care what we took. We had to have a list. As a matter of fact, a copy of the list is in the Holocaust Museum in Washington. I, I gave it to them. <clears throat> and um, she would, so she took stuff that she knew she'd never use in Shanghai. She took silks. She took furs. She took linens. She took crystals. She took... All, uh, all kinds of artifacts, th things uh, that she felt she'd never use in Shanghai, but m would be saleable. Well, Shanghai at that time had a population of approximately 8 million. Most of them, of course, were Chinese. Then you had the Japanese and a smattering a smattering of um, other foreigners, uh, British, Americans, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, who had branch offices of their firms in the British settlement uh, in Shanghai. But then you had two distinct Jewish communities. One was a Baghdadi community, where the uh, people had come from Iraq in the uh, middle in the 1800s, approximately and um, established businesses. They were very wealthy and very philanthropic. The Kaduris, Sassoons, Hardoons, Abram, very wealthy. After the 17 revolution, Russian Jews came. They were pretty well to do too. They had businesses. They were not as wealthy as the Iraqis, but they were very, very comfortable. And now we came. So the joint asked these families to help. Of course, the Kaduri and Sassoon stepped in immediately. They did have the means. Uh, Kaduri got the trucks to take people to the dormitories. Kaduri bought a piece of land in the Hongqiu area of Shanghai to build a school and staffed it with the uh, refugee teachers. And um, also, they, uh, the Hardoons and Kaduris had established a Jewish school. I'll talk about that in a moment. So now um, oh, we're in Shanghai. My mother didn't want to go into the dormitories. And she looked around to uh, rent a room. We rented a furnished room. And then she found an ad for an apartment that a Russian Jew who had fled the revolution had a bunch of buildings in the French concession in a nice part of Shanghai, the Avenue Joffre. And she went to the thrift shops of the Iraqis and sold all the stuff she had brought with her. 
with the proceeds, we bought that apartment. She, uh, my father, before leaving Germany, having always been very mechanical, had gotten a certificate to repair typewriters. My parents established a typewriter business with a Chinese um, mechanic. My mother went knocking on doors to get the uh, customers. She did the appointments, she did the billing, and my father and this Chinese mechanic did the repairs. And now they had to find, a sh and they arranged for my grandmother to come over, who reluctantly came over a year later, in June of 1940. On one of the last ships, the Conte Verde, an Italian ship, she came over, together with one of my mother's salesmen. The uh, Shanghai Jewish School had been established, as I mentioned, by the Sephardic Jews, by the Kaduris and Sassoons. It was run under the British school system. The curriculum was made up in Cambridge, England, meticulously followed. Exam papers were sent back to Cambridge for marking, then came back to Shanghai, and the decision was made into Cambridge whether you were uh, promoted or not. A second language, so everything was in English. A second language taught was French, and under religion, of course, we learned to pray, and uh, we learned some Hebrew. So now came all these refugees' children who lived not in the Hongqiu area. Many of the refugees ended up settling the Hongqiu area because housing was very cheap there. And not all had the wherewithal to start a business or whatever. So, so now the school had a problem. What do you do with all these refugee children who sp spoke every European language except English? Well, they had a very simple solution. Children learn a language the easiest at its most elementary level. I was close to nine years old. I'd been in school in Germany for three years. I was put into kindergarten. And I wasn't too happy cutting out paper dolls, but I must tell you, all of us who were in kindergarten, within approximately three or four months, we all knew English well enough to be placed into the grade proper for our age level. And it was an excellent school. Our teachers were British trained, Iraqis and Russian. And for religion, we had a Polish teacher, one of the refugees who, who taught us their religion. There was a big synagogue on the grounds of the Shanghai Jewish School, still in existence today, not as a synagogue, but the building, a beautiful building that Clinton visited, as a matter of fact, on his trip to Shanghai many years ago. And it is, the building is still, is still there. So um, let me tell you a bit about Shanghai, what the refugees found as far as the climactic condition, everything else. Very bad. The temperature in the summer, using the humidity index that you hear on television, telling you it's, a, it's 100 degrees, but the, humid, but the humidity index is 130, whatever. With the humidity index, the temperature in the summer could go up to 140 degrees in the shade. I remember walking the street and my feet would sink right into the macadam. And, the, and they told us never to go out without a head covering and try not to go out between 12 and 2. The winters, we had no snow, but the monsoons brought a lot of rain. The Wangpu River overflowed, the streets were flooded, and the disease was rampant. We had to be inoculated for cholera, typhus, and paratyphus three times a year which did not give us a total immunity, but at least if we got sick, we had a chance for survival. Smallpox once a year, and that was 100% survival. We had to boil our water at least five minutes past its boiling point. We had to boil all fruits and vegetables for that same length of time. All the years I lived in Shanghai, I never ate a fresh fruit or a fresh vegetable. Unfortunately, the attrition rate among the refugees uh, was tremendous. You know, I used the number 18,000. We never had an exact number. It could have been 20,000, could have been 22,000. But the number 18 is a good Jewish number for Chai. So I like to use the number 18,000, even though it's not an exact number, of course. And, um, and the attrition rate, the young, the ill, the elderly, uh, succumbed to the climactic condition, to the sanitary condition. My father, uh, when he came out of Buchenwald, uh, he had found uh, he had not been well. Uh, they gave them whale meat to eat in the concentration camp. His war wound, which had been a stomach wound, had acted up, had not been treated. So he got sick. 
And then he got better, then he got sick, but unfortunately, he could not uh, recover from that. He died in March of 1941 at the age of 43, uh, leaving my mother, his mother, my grandmother, and myself. I'm an only child, so there were just uh, three of us. So my mother continued the typewriter business on her own with the Chinese mechanic, and uh, she rented a room in the apartment that we had uh, purchased, and uh, we managed. Um, on, uh, on December 8th, 1941, we we're on the other side of the international dateline, we woke up to a tremendous explosion in the harbor of Shanghai. The Japanese had sunk a few sh ships, not with people on it, just to block the, they were anchored there, just to block the harbor of Shanghai. And of course, this was Pearl Harbor. The American staff members of the um, uh, joint, where the American Joint Distribution Committee, were repatriated to the United States. Laura Margulies, the head, stayed. The Japanese issued um, rations to everybody. At the moment, we were treated the same as the rest of the population. We got ration tickets for, for flour, for sugar, for rice, and a few other things. So now, my mother lost all her customers because the uh, Japanese interned all um, nationals of the United States, of Great Britain, and the Benelux country, in other words, all the enemy aliens of Germany and uh, Japan. We lost many of our teachers, we still kept our Russian teachers, and many of the Sephardim, the Iraqi Jews, were interned, because Iraq at that time was a British protectorate, so many of them were British subjects. But the school continued, and my mother now had to make her living in a different way. She dismissed the Chinese mechanic, and she herself did some of the repairs, and I remember going with her uh, in, in a rickshaw as we delivered typewriters. Some of you in the room, the most of you probably not, have uh, seen uh, the uh, typewriters at the time, the Underwood and the Royal. They were big, heavy machines heavier than, the, uh, than some of the computers you lift up today. And uh, she managed to eke, eke out a living. In the meantime, we were worried. When I talked about we and us, I'm talking about the refugees. We were worried what was gonna happen to us because uh, now that the um, uh, Japanese interned their enemy aliens, what were we to them? We were the enemies of their allies. But for the moment, we were left alone. I did not find out till years and years and years later, when I did research on my book, that in 1942, Joseph Albert Meisinger, who was also called the Butcher of Warsaw, a Gestapo agent, came to Shanghai. As I say, we did not know that at the time. I'm telling you now, so in the context of what happened, you'll understand. Came to Shanghai and spoke to the vice consul and said, I want you to do away with all these people. And they said, what do you mean? Well, they're our enemies. Either shoot them all or put them on ships to sea without food and water. And the Japanese refused. They said we, they weren't gonna do it. However, these were their allies and they had to do something. So they had a compromise. It says, we'll, we will place these people into a designated area where we can keep an eye on them so that they will not sabotage our war effort. And indeed, that's what they did. The Japanese issued a proclamation in February, February 1943 stating that all stateless people who came to Shanghai after 1937 have three months in which to relocate to a designated area, and the designated area that was picked was a section of the Hongqiu that I met, uh, I uh, told you about at the beginning of my talk. So we had three months to relocate to Hongqiu. That document never used the word Jew. It just said stateless, because all of us who came to Shanghai we came to Shanghai with valid passports, which of course expired and could never be renewed. So we were stateless. 
So that encompassed, encompassed all of us. So my mother sold our apartment to a uh, Japanese family. My grandmother at that time was in a uh, Russian Jewish nursing home. She died at the age of 74 of, in uh, March of 1943. And with three other families, we moved into a, uh, I guess you can call it a hovel, a tenement house, a, pr a pretty awful building. It had four rooms. My mother and I, being the smallest family, we had the smallest room with a cement floor. We had a table, two chairs, and a bed in that room. If a third person came in, they had to lie down on the bed. Uh, there was no running water in the rooms. We put in a sink for cold water. Uh, there was no toilet in the house. We put in one toilet downstairs for the 10 of us, a flush toilet. They did not have a flush toilet. Uh, we cooked on a little Chinese stove on top of the roof. The stove was about, oh, this high. And we'd buy uh, the black coal dust, mix it with water, uh, make little egg-shaped balls, put it in there with some newspaper, and then you'd have to fan it to cook. Of course, that would take a very long time, not just to cook, but even to have your drinking water. There was a solution to that, too. At the entrance to the lane, it was called a lane where the houses were, there was a hot water stand. You could buy boiling water, and you could buy hot water. The boiling water is a little more expensive than the hot water. So if you didn't have the money for the hot water, you bought the boiling water, then it didn't take quite that long for the water to boil. Our school, of course, now was uh, way out of the ghetto area. Most of the parents, including my mother, wanted us kids to go to the school, which was 10 minutes away, which was the one that Kaduri had built and Stafford's refugee teachers. But you know how kids are. You don't want to leave your friends. Our friends were in the other school. Uh, there were Russian friends still and Iraqi friends, etc. We weren't going to go there. We were going to go to that school. It would take us over two hours to get there every day, but we were not going to change school. There was a man by the name of Goya, a Japanese gentleman by the name of Goya, who got that very important position of giving passes to refugees that wanted to leave the ghetto area. You, he gave a pass if you could show that you needed to make a living outside the ghetto area, and at his whim, you got a pass or not. Um, tall men had a big problem because he was a little guy. So tall men had a big problem getting a pass. He was little, not much taller than I am. So uh, our parents, including my mother, of course, said, well, if you go to Goya and he gives you a pass to leave the ghetto area, we'll let you go to school, figuring Goya is never going to give you a pass. The strange thing is, we got there and stood online. Goya used to come out in the morning. Oh, he gave himself a very impressive title, King of the Jews. He used to come out and to see who's online. And he'd see us kids online. He says, you kids online to get a pass to go to school? We said, yes, says, kids have to go to school. Come to the front of the line. We never had a problem getting a pass. Well, we had to walk to a, out of the ghetto, get onto a bus, get onto a tram, get onto another bus, walk again, and yet we, we kept going to uh, our, <clears throat> our school. Of course, now my mother had no business at all aside from all her other clients being interned. Now she was uh, in, the, in a one, little one room. Nobody was interested in typewriters. Nobody had any money. There was no money for food. There was very little food around. So she had no business. Uh, so she wrote a letter to one of her French clients in the French concession and asked her to send her a letter saying that she was still servicing her typewriters. Uh, armed with that letter, she went to see Goya. And Goya looked at her, he says, you, woman, repairing typewriter? She says, yes, my husband had the business, he died, and I still have uh, clients. He gave her a pass. Well, my mother had no intention of going to the French concession and repairing typewriters. Armed with that pass, what she did, she got off the tram before it went to the French concession. She went into the um, Chinese areas of the city where Westerners usually didn't go. And she'd buy up scarves, sunglasses, belts, silk stockings, uh, you know, sundry, small thing. And she'd put them into the toolbox that she carried with her to show that she was going to 
do typewriters, and brought them back into the ghetto. Was not illegal what she did buying that stuff. What was illegal was that she didn't go where she was supposed to go. She brought these things back into the ghetto and gave them to the um, on consignment to refugee peddlers in the ghetto. It did not bring in very much, but it put us about maybe half a step above starvation levels. In the meantime, we had uh, uh, we had strafings by the Americans, but the city itself had not been bombed. My mother found various ways of putting food together and stuff together. For instance, for the Shabbat candles, you know, candles were too expensive. She took little pieces of uh, metal, and you know, having had uh, my parents, the business that I had, they had in Germany was a paper and twine wholesale business. She had brought a lot of twine with her. She made little wicks with that, so we had it for Shabbat candles. She did the same things for Hanukkah. And uh, then she found other ways of putting food together. Um, we were the only people who were kosher in the building. And um, the people there rendered all kinds of uh, fat. My mother rendered beef fat, and everybody was screaming at her, the stink in the house. But it looked like ch chicken fat, so we made believe it was chicken fat. And we had rations for bread, so we were able to do that. <laughs> Um, she, a um, little Chinese boy used to chase grocery trucks and cut a hole in the sack and the, the noodles would fall in the gutter and they'd be swept up and sold very cheaply. So my mother bought that and then we sat around the uh, kerosene lamp and separate the noodles from the debris like glass, nails, you know, whatever's picked up in the gutter. So we'd have noodles and somehow we managed. We heard, of course, in the beginning of 1945 that Germany had unconditionally surrendered. These were the first news that came to us, and people right away, before you heard other news, of course, said, what are we doing here? We're still at war because we were in the Pacific Theater, and we're starving, we're dying of starvation. A lot of people did die of starvation. Uh, we're dying, and uh, bad climate, and we are with the Japanese. We should have stayed wherever home was, Germany, Hungary, uh, Poland, Hungary, Poland, wherever it was, instead of being here. Of course, words started trickling in very slowly, uh, what we missed. As soon as we heard what we missed, Shanghai wasn't so hot, wasn't so cold, we weren't so hungry, the Japanese weren't so terrible. And we were very grateful, really, that we were in Shanghai. However, we were still at war. We didn't know what was happening. Then we heard about the atomic bomb. And now we knew that Shanghai was a military target. Uh, the, uh, the Americans were with Chiang Kai-shek and Chongqing. People heard a little bit on the short wave, which was illegal, but people heard some news anyway about it. And... Um, we say, uh-uh, they're going to drop this bomb on Shanghai. Then they brought the second bomb, Nagasaki, and we were very worried indeed. But so far, all we had were strafings. You know, we'd see American and Japanese fighter planes up in the sky, and, you know, kids being kids, we did stupid things. We uh, stood up on the roof, and we'd bet with marbles who would shoot down whom as the shrapnel was falling, falling around us. But luckily, I guess we were immune. Nobody ever got hurt. And, uh, but we were worried what was going to happen. July 17th, 1945, my mother was on one of her illegal forays into the city of Shanghai. There was no school, it was the summer, so I had no pass to go or leave the ghetto. And I was taking a walk to a friend's house when all of a sudden the dreaded siren went off that the city was under attack. The uh, Japanese had instituted a fantastic uh, al alarm system. Uh, different sirens at different times would mean that outskirts of the city and uh, flying over or whatever, and all clear. Well, this was this uh, one siren we had never heard of. I was in the street, and you could not build um, uh, shelters because you dug five feet. The, geolo the geology of Shanghai being such, you dig five feet, you hit water. But there were trenches in the street. I jumped into a trench, and I heard the bombs falling. The ghetto had been bombed by the Americans. 
Their target, they had two targets that day, and the day was all overcast. One target was the Japanese radio station, which was on the outskirts of the ghetto. That took a direct hit, and that's why 30 refugees got killed, a few hundred were wounded, and, and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Chinese got killed that day. Their second target, luckily, they missed. Across the street where we lived in the ghetto was what we thought was a little shirt factory because we'd see people walk in, walk out, come out for lunch with little packages. Turned out it was one of the biggest munitions dump in that part of China and a target of the Americans throughout the war. I wouldn't be telling you the story here today if they hadn't missed that, uh, that particular target. Well, a few weeks later, the war was over. General, General Chiang Kai-shek, uh, together with the Americans, uh, came to Shanghai, and we were liberated. So um, those of us who were still around, of course, it, it was <laughs> a wonderful day for us to see the Americans, and the hospital ship Hope came, and we kids went to the wharf, and the sailors took us up and had my first taste of Coca-Cola and I still haven't lost that taste in 1945. So bas this basically is the story of the survival of approximately 18,000 Jews in Shanghai. As I said, it was a very difficult life. A lot of people did not survive, but for those of us who did, we were very, I find, I'm not just a survivor, I'm a very lucky survivor. The Japanese did not bother, Bother us. Yes, they had rules and regulation. After all, it was war. <laughs> they had um, inconvenient, annoying rules and regulations. But I didn't have to worry about being picked up by a truck or a Japanese just shooting me in the back or dragging me off somewhere. I could walk in the street next to a Japanese soldier without a problem. The Chinese had different problems with them. I'm talking about us now, the refugees. The Chinese did have a lot of problems with them. But for us, they, we've, you followed their rules and regulations, and you had no problem. So um, this is our story, and you see an exhibit there. As a matter of fact, they left out my panel, and I'm going to call them uh, in Shanghai and tell them to, to send it over, because they had a big exhibit in Rockefeller Center where they had a panel of me, and my kids were there for a reunion and all that. But I am very happy that they're publicizing our story about the survival in Shanghai. And thank you very much.